Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Uh, we have two more minutes to eleven. So, how? So, how is the weather over there? Where are you joining from, Dan? I'm I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, so the weather has been pretty good. Um, the last couple of weeks we've been hitting high seventies, low eighties. Um, we have in storm, and I think that's passed. And uh, we are in the midst of horrible allergy season right now. So, <laughs> once we get past that, I'll be okay. Great. Uh, it's how much? How much? Where you guys are in North Dakota? What's the weather like right now? Yeah, it's raining now. I know it's oh, okay. resident, so I think it's not bad. But uh, yeah, we've been doing this for the last two years, and the webinar okay. is getting attention. We also jointly hosted by several other universities, so multiple mm -hmm. grad students and faculty are also joining. Wonderful. And uh, we also made it make it available on you know, on our YouTube channel. And I also promoted this on Power Globe, so I see a lot of people joining from wonderful um, folks too. So that's good. Okay, we can get started. I think um, I'll introduce you. Um, good morning, everyone, for this distinguished webinar series in AI and cybersecurity. Today's uh, talk is featuring Dr. Daniel Arnold, and you know, focusing on operational cybersecurity for distributed energy resources, you know, using optimization, control theory, and machine learning. Dr. Daniel is a research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and an adjunct professor of civil and environmental engineering at UC Berkeley. He graduated from UC Berkeley with a PhD in mechanical engineering in 2015 and was an ITRI Rosenfeld postdoctoral fellow at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab from 2016 to 2017. His research interests are in fields of control theory, optimization, and machine learning. His recent work focuses on the use of these techniques for cybersecurity of electric power system and other critical infrastructure. Dan, thank you so much for um, agreeing to this talk. So it's a great honor to have you as part of the oh, webinar series. Thank and, you very much. It's my absolute pleasure. And uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. All right. So Prakash, I guess you have you have a, a, a audience who some some folks are power systems background, other folks are you know computer science students. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great, yeah. good, good. That's that. I, I typically sit at the intersection of those two disciplines, so I should be able to speak to each group, hopefully with um uh, and have have part of that understood. So um, looking forward to this talk. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, let me just move a couple of things around here on the Zoom panel. There we go. All right, so um, thanks for that great introduction, Prakash. Um, I, I'm um, uh, uh, Dan. I'm uh, I, I'm very happy to, to be giving this talk to you guys today um, on some work that we've been doing at Berkeley Lab for the past, oh gosh, almost ten years now. Um, uh, really at the intersection of what I'll call algorithmic decision making and power systems. And so we we algorithmic decision making. You know, I, I consider that to include. AI machine learning, as well as optimization and control theory. Um, I have a robotics background. My background's primarily in control theory. And so I, I found that we can actually use a lot of these tools that we'll use from robotics, um, uh, control theory uh, for cybersecurity of power systems. And we have a very kind of, we have a very rich research effort at Berkeley Lab and at UC Berkeley um, in this area. All right, so let me click. There we go. I'll use the mouse to advance, it looks like. All right, so just a little bit about me. Um, I'm a research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. If um, any of you have seen the movie Oppenheimer, um, uh, a lot, a lot of a lot of the foundational work for the atomic bomb was done at, at LBNL and UC Berkeley. And, and at those th those images when they're on campus, those are actually real. I've taught in some of those classrooms. It's super cool. Um, um, but anyway, that's a bit a bit of history there. I'm also an adjunct faculty member at. Um, UC Berkeley in the civil engineering department. I teach a course on data science for power systems. Um, I did my postdoc at Berkeley Lab, PhD at, UC, at Cal, and um, uh, master's and um, uh, uh, bachelor's degree at UC San Diego. So all up and down the California coast. Um, uh, and um, in between my my MS, so I let, let me back up and explain these pictures here. So starting in the lower left, we're gonna work our way uh, counterclockwise. Um, uh, my background is in control theory. And so this block diagram a search algorithm for uh, that we deployed on a um, underwater robot, which is shown here in the in the center. Uh, I did some work after my my master's degree for the Navy um, uh, on underwater robotics. Um, when I wanted to go back and get my 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 doctorate, um, let me minimize this thing here. Sorry. When I wanted to go back and get my doctorate, I knew I wanted to work on the clean energy transition. And so I, when I went to Cal, I, I decided to 
see if I could find a, a use for the tools I've been I've been developing in controls and optimization for the power systems. It turns out that Power Grid is a very rich environment for the application of these tools. Um, and then um, uh, after my PhD, postdoc at Berkeley Lab, and um, when I became a scientist, I really wanted to keep pushing on on this this open door, um, uh, which was kind of the intersection of of mostly control theory. Uh, and power systems specifically applied to cybersecurity. And so all of the work I do is, is funded by the cybersecurity office at DOE. I'm not a traditional cybersecurity person. I, I, I really don't know much about IT cybersecurity at all. I focus mostly on the operational side. And from my perspective, a lot of cybersecurity issues that, that could show up in the power grid are primarily um, uh, aimed at destabilizing a lot of the interactions of devices in the grid. So there's a very rich area for the application of control theory there, uh, in my opinion. And this figure on the upper right is um, something we worked on a few years ago for DOE, um, which I'll, I'll talk about later in the talk, um, uh, where a, an adversary is trying to um, attack a portion of um, uh, rooftop solar systems in a power grid, and they can create these, these instabilities. And we've come up with different ways we can adjust the system through adaptive control uh, to mitigate those instabilities in real time. So uh, a brief history of the research we do at, at Berkeley Lab. Um, we've been supporting DOE cybersecurity mission um, since 2012, since before I joined the lab. Uh, most of our recent funding comes from a relatively new office in DOE, the Cybersecurity, Energy Security, Emergency Response, the CSER office. Uh, they, are, they are funding the entirety of our cybersecurity work right now. Um, the team that we have at, at LBNL um, uh, is a nice um, uh, a nice collection of skills, which range from algorithmic decision making, so control theory optimization, machine learning, of course, power systems, and then my my one of my colleagues, Sean Pysert, um is an expert in computer security and has um, uh, has leading a couple projects aimed at differential privacy and secure architecture. Uh, if I had to bin the type of work that we do at Berkeley Lab into two groups, I would say we have one, you know, a collection of projects that are focused on the use of, you know, AI, machine learning, control, primarily for distribution system cybersecurity. We've had three projects from CSER. We have one active right now, totaling $10 million in funding in the last eight or so years. Uh, and then my colleague Sean leads projects at, uh, which are focused on the application of privacy preserving techniques. So using differential privacy, essentially, uh, uh, to anonymize grid data so that it can be shared for cybersecurity. We've had two projects um, uh, uh, focusing on the development of techniques in this area. One project is active, um, totaling about uh, seven and a half million dollars in funding over the past eight or so years. Uh, the work we do would not be possible without some of the, the expert um, uh, um, expertise of, of some wonderful partners we have. Um, NRECA is a um, trade organization that represents electric cooperatives. I, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I under, as I understand, in North Dakota, a, a variety, uh, the vast majority of the geographic landscape is served by electric co-ops. You guys might even be powered by co-ops right now. Um, and NRECA is an organization that represents their interests. So we partner with them quite often. We have a very rich partnership with Cornell, uh, we work a lot with Siemens, um, and we have uh, a Kavala as a startup company in, in uh, the Bay Area that's doing some great work at the intersection of AI and power system modeling. The California Energy Commission, Portland General Electric, and we have a variety of other partners as well. So uh, the talk today, um, I'm going to get into uh, a little bit of the background about how the grid is rapidly changing. It sounds like for half of you, this will be very, very uh, familiar. Maybe the other half, there could be some new things uh, uh, in here. And then I'm going to get in specifically to the challenges associated with what I'll call DER, and I'll define what that is in, in a minute. Uh, and then I'll talk about how um, uh, I'll provide two examples of the work that we've done uh, where we've used tools from decision making theory, adaptive control, um, and reinforcement learning in GAs uh, for operational cybersecurity of power systems. And then I'll briefly talk about what I see as a major future challenge and some research opportunities. Uh, and you guys can feel free to interrupt me anytime. I'm, I'm a professor, so I'm used to being constantly interrupted. So just go, go right ahead and raise your hand and speak up if there's any questions. All right, so um, it should become as no surprise to uh, folks on the call that um, there is over the past, you know, uh, really decade, decade and a half, there's been a real explosion uh, in the adoption of, of solar systems. Uh, this includes rooftop solar systems like you might have on your house uh, and utility scale systems, so large solar farms. Uh, very interestingly, uh, you know, 
the the operation of these two systems, even though they're deployed on your house or um, on a large solar plant, they operate very similarly. Not not just in how they condition power for export to the to the to the grid, but in terms of how they're they're regulated and the standards that are that are that are governing their behavior. Um, uh, I want to back up uh, and just briefly uh, uh, set the stage here for. Um, uh, the area in which we do our work, the distribution grid. So if 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 you have to break the entirety of the power system up into into three groups into into, into three pieces, those pieces would be generation, transmission, and distribution. So generation historically, the large, large power plants, gas, oil, coal, um, uh, large um, uh, hydro uh, that make a ton of power. Uh, and then that power has to get transmitted to population centers. So uh, when we want to move large amounts of power, that happens over the transmission system, right? So these are the very, very large uh, um, power lines you'll see uh, kind of crisscrossing the, um, the the landscape, sometimes in very remote areas that that take that really move large amounts of power there. Now, when we get to uh, a population center, uh, that power is then um, transformed to a lower voltage through a substation, and it, we enter the distribution grid. And the distribution grid is, is the power lines you'll see walking down the street that are transmitting power from the substation to your home, your 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 uh, business, um, you know, where you, where you go to get your hair cut. Uh, uh, and it's 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 what's interesting is when you look back at the investments that were made in the power system over the last fifty or so years, most of the investments were made in generation and transmission distribution system uh, has historically uh, been the element of the power system where we've invested the least. Uh, so it's kind of the least modern, although that's changing a little bit now. But what's very interesting about this, this, this part of the power system now is that we're seeing the most new technology added here, right? And so it's it's at the distribution system where we're adding rooftop solar systems, uh, electric vehicles and batteries. And so you have this very interesting intersection of like uh, um, a an older infrastructure that's now supporting this brand new, uh, very, very fancy technology. And it, there, there's a lot of challenges associated with that um, in realizing our clean energy future. So I briefly just want to talk about um, uh, kind of the vision with which we're approaching how we, we architect our solutions for cybersecurity. So we do a lot of work I mentioned before with NRECA, which represents the electric cooperatives in the United States. And so um, co-ops uh, um, uh, by by geography provide power to over over half of the land mass in California, uh, in, California uh, in the U.S. Uh, and, and when you look at North Dakota, it's it's that number looks like 98% probably of the land mass served by electric cooperatives. So 42 million people are served by the co-ops, including 92% of the persistent poverty counties uh, in the US. Now, electric co-ops are not like the big utilities you'll find maybe like in New York City or Chicago or San Francisco, PG&E. Uh, th th those entities are very large, um, have large ratepayer bases, have, have funding uh, for activities like cybersecurity, for R&D. Uh, electric cooperatives do not have those resources. And so um, through NRECA, we work with the co-op try to um, solutions that are useful uh, for these entities, which will have limited R&D and technical staff. And so some of the work I'll be talking about later in terms of how we want to simplify AI uh, simplify machine learning, simplify simplify control theory for use with these entities is is done with the vision that these co-ops could then take and use these tools that um, you know sometimes could be off limits to them and only available to the big the bigger utilities. So um, getting into the technical detail of the talk here, um, the cybersecurity issues that I'm going to talk about are, are, are focused on what I'll call distributed energy resources. And these are, this term is kind of a catch-all for anything in the distribution grid that essentially takes DC power and needs to turn it into AC power for use in the power grid. And so this includes your solar systems, your rooftop solar systems. It includes your batteries. Uh, it, uh, you know, so Tesla power walls, for instance. It also includes your electric vehicles. Uh, and these are entities that primarily deal on the device side with direct current. Uh, however, in order to change that power into something that the grid can utilize, that power needs to be converted from DC to AC. Uh, and we this is accomplished through a device called the inverter, right? And that's its primary job is to take AC power, turn it into DC, and vice versa. So this allows power to be exchanged between the device and the power system. 
So um, the role of this quote unquote smart inverter, its fundamental job is to convert DC to AC power and vice versa. However, that power needs to be conditioned so that it can be delivered to the grid, uh, um, uh, delivered correctly to the grid. And so one of the things we have to care about is the frequency of the AC sinusoid. That, that is for folks who are in power systems, you guys know that is a fundamentally critically important um, health uh, a metric that tells us how 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 um, how healthy the grid is. So it's very important that we we match that frequency. We have to ensure that the sinusoids that we're creating um, in the conversion process are of the proper phase. The phase difference essentially is what controls a lot of the power transfer uh, um, between devices in in the AC power grid. And we have to match the voltage as well. Um, however, in addition to this fundamental um, these fundamental um, um, uh, uh, behaviors that that the the inverter has to perform. Uh, there is also um, intelligence in these devices to actually to support the power system uh, um, uh, under times of stress. And so this it's it's with this in mind that I'm going to talk about some of the DER cybersecurity challenges. All right, so um, uh, probably the most influential standard that governs these grid support functions is the IEEE. Uh, 1547 uh, standard. I have the 2018 version here. It's, it's currently, uh, I was just reading the 2022 revision the other day, uh, but this is a standard that um, uh, is now become the de facto guidelines for how devices, how DER connected to the power system are going to respond when there's adverse conditions that, that, that are showing up at the power system. So an example of how the devices could respond, I'm showing here in the right-hand side, which is the depiction of, in the top, a volt VAR curve, and at the bottom, a volt watt curve. Now, what these, these are control functions that will change the amount of power that DER inject into the system as a function of the grid voltage. And what these curves are telling the device to do is if the voltage gets too high, you're gonna consume power and try and bring the voltage back down. And if the voltage ever gets too low, you're gonna try and inject more power to bring the voltage back up. So this is a function that, that every DER uh, coming into the system now has. I have one of, uh, in my rooftop system I got a couple of years ago, these functions are online and, and, and active. Um, and they're going to control individual devices to try and help the system out uh, um, uh, if the system is under stressed. And so um, there is no one size fits all um, correct parameterization of these control functions. Uh, these functions are, in fact, designed to be adjusted. And there are mechanisms included in the DER, in the inverter specifically, uh, so that uh, like your utility, um, uh, the installer, aggregator if, if you if you if you if you have one of those can adjust these things to tailor the response of the device grid that you're on uh, and then it, even in the standard the IEEE standard includes uh, some guidance on um, what uh, uh, these parameters can be there that goes away uh, uh, however there is there there is there's a knowledge gap here and I've highlighted this in the lower portion of this table which I pulled directly from the standard improper choice of these parameters uh, can and has been shown to lead to what are grid instabilities. And so it there there is there is some vagueness here uh, uh, for um, for a particular deployment of settings in these grid support functions. The question is will these settings cause adverse effects in your power system when they're actually designed to help the power system. And so uh, that really is, is what's setting the stage for the cybersecurity vulnerability that we explore in our work here. So when you couple this with the fact that these devices are incredibly DER, uh, uh, these DER are incredibly IoT connected, um, uh, um, there is an expansion of the cyber attack, a substantial expansion of the cyber attack surface here. So there's this great example that occurred in Hawaii a few years ago, back in 2015 or 2016, I think, uh, where, um, you know, Hawaii, they have so much sunshine, they're really leading the nation in, in deployment of solar systems, right, rooftop solar systems specifically. And so uh, there were so much there was so much solar in Hawaii uh, um, that the Hawaiian grid operator worked with the vendor, Enphase in this case, to remotely update 800,000 inverters in a single day on Oahu. Right, and so there was somebody who pushed a, a button back in Enphase's, um, you know, command center, uh, which isn't far from where I'm sitting right now, actually. Um, and four fifths of all of the rooftop systems in Hawaii changed their behavior. Right, and so, you know, we 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 now have the situation where 
you have hundreds of thousands of devices being deployed in the system. And then you have these bottlenecks where you have very few systems that can, but they can, they can reach many, many, many devices and actually change how they're interacting with the power grid. And so this is something that is that is concerning to us uh, and something that we are, are trying to architect cybersecurity um, solutions around. So just to put a pit in the threat model here, uh, in, in when you think about all the DER deployed in a specific grid, every device, be it your battery, your rooftop solar system, even, even electric vehicles follow these same standards, actually. Um, they have their own grid support functions. And what we're worried about is an adversary making adjustments, making very small adjustments to many, many devices. Now, if you were to monitor um, on an individual device by device basis, these changes may be so small and so innocuous that you may not think it's a big deal. However, small changes to many, many devices is in fact a large change to the system, could have a large effect on the system. And that's what we're worried about. So what are some of the effects on the grid that um, uh, manipulations of these control parameters in a subset of DER in the system, what, 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 what will happen to the power system there? So we've studied two attacks. We studied many attacks, but two really stand out that are highly illustrative. So I'll talk about those today. Um, one is the destabilization of the feedback interconnection between the DER and the power grid. And when you destabilize this interconnection, what ends up happening is the the the, the solar panel, the battery, the electric vehicle cannot find a um, an equilibrium point uh, with which it wants to exchange power with the power system. It, it, it's constantly oscillating between a large power injection or consumption and and very little, and and so we can't find a um, a proper point at which to charge your electric vehicle, for instance. Another um, attack that we've looked at are the creation of large uh, voltage imbalances in three-phase systems. And this is very important if you are connecting three-phase motors to your system. Large imbalances there can cause motors to actually burn up and, and destroy themselves. And so you'd have to disconnect from the system if that were the case. And other um, uh, processes like um, semiconductor manufacturing is incredibly sensitive to these type of power quality issues. So actually, um, uh, causing large voltage imbalances would necessitate disconnection or the ceasing of manufacture. Um, and, and that is something that we'd like to avoid uh, as well um, if you're building critical components like semiconductors or things like that. All right, so we've set the stage now. Um, we're familiar with with the, the the devices, the threat model, and some of the implications that can come from um, uh, cyber attacks on these devices. Let's talk about how we, as folks who want to protect the system, what can we do using the tools from algorithmic decision making? So we're going to utilize the same sort of, we're going to utilize the actual threat vector that we've identified as the means to do control here. So if an adversary is able to gain access to um, a portion of the system, say they compromise end phases systems, and all the end phase devices are going to get bad settings. They're going to create the problems we just talked about in the power system. We are going to design algorithms to control the remaining set of devices. So the devices in blue, maybe these are your Teslas, maybe these are your solar edge devices, right? And uh, we are going to adjust their behavior. And essentially, you can think of it as kind of like a game theoretic approach where the adversary is going to propose a set of parameters that are going to create problems. And then we are going to react to that and are going to position the rest of the system in a way that we, we either resist or ameliorate those, those effects. And how we do this is um, through some uh, uh, very kind of I don't want to say simplistic, but um, uh, oh, interesting ways that we adjust the parameters in the um, uh, in the grid support functions. And so, what we essentially end up doing is we take those piecewise linear curves that we, that I showed previously, and we we stretch them out, we slide them around on the voltage axis, and we do that until we 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 um, have put the system into a new state where the attack is has been defeated. And an example of this process underway is shown in the right, where at a certain time um, in this voltage, this is a time series of voltages in, in the power system, um, in, in a grid that we were studying in simulation, uh, we introduce a cyber attack, which creates this instability, and then we start this adjustment of parameters and devices that we control. And as you can see, eventually that attack, these oscillations uh, go away. We've looked at a variety of different um, control paradigms. Uh, uh, with which we've implemented these algorithms. So we, we, we've looked at centralized algorithms where you have per perhaps a utility uh, who is able to control 
a subset of distributed energy resources of DER from their control center, and they're going to send out um, parameters to these devices on, on their own, and uh, 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 I'm sorry, from a centralized uh, location. And then we've looked at distributed architectures where, where we actually embed the control algorithms on each individual device. And those devices just kind of sit back and look for signatures like these oscillations, and then they adjust their own behavior. The advantage of the distributed case is that there's no communication required, uh, and and that the 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 um, the response can come very quickly. Uh, and DOE is actually exploring a patent on that um, on that algorithm uh, as we speak. Um, so the first type of um, uh, uh, algorithm that we we deployed specifically to mitigate the the attacks that create oscillations in the systems was was making use of adaptive control. And adaptive control is is nice in this case because it's relatively straightforward and simple to implement. So we have a couple differential equations that we implement on the device as well as one one switch case. And this is logic that we deployed on the individual devices. So on the every individual rooftop solar system, uh, battery or electric vehicle in a given grid is how this would would be realized. And these devices just kind of sit inside the control logic of the of the smart inverter model, wait for these attacks to show up. And then we'll make adjustments specifically to the control logic highlighted in blue there um, uh, uh, until the attack uh, goes away. And if you're interested, you can read about this algorithm in this transactions paper, which we published a, a, just over a year ago. Uh, this is an example of this, this control strategy working um, on a, a real grid model from San Diego Gas and Electric Company um, uh, with some of their grid data that we used and, and some of their solar deployment data that, that we used. And um, we created the scenario where a portion of devices in the system were attacked. Um, this leads to a, a substantial oscillation in the grid voltages uh, at the top when we're not doing any control. That's very bad. We want to get rid of that. And then um, when we go and deploy... Um, uh, our control scheme, you can see uh, in the bottom subplot on the right that those oscillations are mitigated um, relatively quickly. Um, when the types of attacks become more sophisticated in nature, the what we found is that the adaptive control is is um, as we formulated it uh, is not was not able to was not was not a useful tool to defeat these attacks. So we more sophisticated attacker needed a more sophisticated response, and so we've experimented quite a bit with reinforcement learning uh, in order to make these parameter adjustments and non-compromised units to defeat these attacks. And uh, in, in reinforcement learning, this is a simplistic diagram of how our, our architecture, our, our agent, which is the decision maker, is, is trained here. Uh, we have an environment which we created, which is um, built on OpenDSS, which is an uh, open source um, power system simulation tool that's popular with distribution utilities. Uh, and then we've added some additional Python code to represent the, the inverter behavior, the physics of solar and battery and electric vehicles. And we use this environment to essentially test out different strategies for mitigating the attack. So test out different parameter combinations that we think uh, might be effective mitigating the attacks. And so it, this loop illustrates how this agent is trained. And so the agent will suggest um, control parameters for those smart inverter functions for EVs, for batteries, for solar systems. We deploy those and we roll out um, a simulation of those settings using using um, a Monte Carlo techniques uh, um, uh, in various um, uh, instances of this environment. And then we see if these parameter combinations were useful in defeating those attacks. And if they were, we give the agent a reward. And if they weren't, the agent gets a penalty. And so through repeated um, uh, use of, of this training loop, we end up training the agent to recognize which sets of parameters are effective in beating these attacks um, uh, and minimizing the metrics, uh, uh, maximizing the power quality metrics that we care about uh, in, in the grid. Uh, we, we utilize kind of the same um, principle of adjusting the smart inverter control functions as we did in the adaptive control case, where we are playing around with the shape of these curves. Essentially, we're squishing them, we're pulling them apart, we're translating them left and right um, on the voltage axis. And um, uh, what we end up doing is essentially adding a uh, neural network which um, is directly uh, inputting the, um, the new control parameters into the smart inverter control functions. Um, um, so it's a bit more complicated architecture for control than we had in the adaptive control case. Uh, and if you're interested, you can read about it in this ACC paper we published a couple of years ago. 
I have um, some experimental results I can talk about now, um, uh, uh, mostly from the papers that I previously mentioned. But um, what I'm going to talk about now are, um, uh, so we tested these algorithms on a, an IEEE test feeder, so very popular to do that, uh, unbalanced systems so or modeling three-phase voltages here. And in this particular experiment, we looked at um, what happens when an attacker compromises an equivalent portion by capacity of DER at every node. And that's represented by the red slices of the green pie there. So the, 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 the circle is the overall capacity and the red portion represents some amount of DER that have been compromised. Um, we've looked at we've looked at attacks where all of the devices at a given in a given portion of the system have been compromised and where the attacks have been more randomized. This is an illustrative case, which I felt was kind of useful for this presentation. The algorithms have performed very well in all the cases we've tested. Um, so uh, the red portion of the circles represents converter capacity, either rooftop solar, batteries, or EVs that have been compromised. And th th that compromised amount of DER is going to create uh, two types of attacks. So the voltage imbalance attack, which we looked at earlier, um, and the oscillation attack, which we also talked about a little bit earlier. So let's go ahead and see what happens when um, we deploy our control solutions uh, to mitigate these attacks. So uh, on the left here is the uh, the no control case, no defense case, uh, where the attacker is seeking to create a large voltage imbalance in this experiment. Uh, and so what happens is we have a, um, a several minute simulation, uh, um, a second level resolution of the power system. And uh, we're showing the voltage at one given node in the system here. And as you can see in the shaded region, when the attack occurs, the attacker is able to, to roll out settings to the, the portion of devices that it controls to create a large voltage imbalance in the system. Uh, that's the top subplot. The second subplot is the metric that, that measures the actual voltage imbalance. Uh, and the third and fourth subplots are showing what our agent is doing to mitigate that attack. So we're not doing anything, basically, um, uh, in, in the plot on the left. When you look over to the right, uh, there is a significant effect in the system when we deploy our response here. And so uh, what, what happens when we, we have our controllers active um, mitigating these attacks is we're able to squish those voltages back together. And so we really, really stamp out the voltage imbalance attack right as soon as it happens. And then you can see that the level of imbalance goes back to below, uh, actually just about what it was before the attack. Uh, and then you can see the 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 action our agent took, um, as well as the amount of power injected that resulted from that action in the third and fourth subplots on the right, respectively. The same story for the voltage oscillation attack. On the left is the no defense case uh, in the shaded region. The adversary creates an attack. Um, the feedback interconnection is destabilized. Those oscillations have a certain energy, which is plotted in the second subplot. And then our controllers aren't doing anything. And then what happens when uh, we deploy our controller is we very quickly after the attack occurs um, are able to mitigate those oscillations. And um, you can see the energy of the oscillations in subplot. And the second subplot from the top on the right is drastically reduced. And then the action our agent took um, in the third and fourth subplots are also shown. All right, so just a summary of the reinforcement learning approach here. Um, the experiments that we used in, uh, uh, so the algorithms that we use in these experiments are, were, were, were nothing really fancy. They're off the shelf, essentially, um, uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. So we looked at PPO, other policy gradient techniques. We looked at DDPG. We didn't do anything fancy to those algorithms. The real kind of art, uh, and which is what I found with a lot of reinforcement learning, is really in the curation of the environment and the reward. So that's really where the, the creativity goes into place. Um, the agents were just standard feedforward neural networks, so nothing fancy there. What we found is that these approaches were effective in mitigating the effects of attacks on DER when approximately up to 40% of the assets by capacity were, were, were attacked. Um, this is actually a pretty intuitive res uh, result. And the reason why our, our algorithms don't mitigate the attacks when you increase beyond this is that there's just there's just the, the attackers just overwhelm the system. We don't have enough assets that we can control that can counteract the, the effect of the attacker. Um, uh, when we approach 50% uh, um, penetration of the attack. Um, however, we do make the we, we do make the response less severe, really in all cases. And so it's still worthwhile to deploy these algorithms even if you control very little assets in the system. 
Um, one of the um, kind of drawbacks of the RL approach was the need for, I would say, modest compute resources. So we're talking in the tens of hours to train these things. And this was mostly due to bottlenecks in the PowerFlow simulator introduced by OpenDSS. There's a lot of room for improvement here, but it's unlikely that utilities are going to suddenly adopt a, um, a let's say, a um, uh, an AI ML compliant, um, highly paral parallelizable a power flow solver um, uh, that would really speed the training up here. Uh, but that's really where the, the gains could be had in improving the training time. And so taking taking these results kind of back to the inspiration for this work, where we want to work with the electric co-ops and now they have very modest resources here. Um, you know, one of the things we, one of the questions we started asking ourselves are, you know, is a co-op going to have to retrain this algorithm constantly or, you know, fairly often when they reconfigure their system? Uh, and is this approach really equitable for them? You know, given, given that they don't have the expertise and the funding to go pay for, you know, um, large compute cycles on AWS or Google Cloud. Uh, uh, to come up with these solutions. And so we did, a little, we did a little bit of work experimenting with replacing the reinforcement learning with a simpler algorithm. And so we used um, augmented random search, which has become very popular um, uh, recently. Uh, there's Ben Recht at UC Berkeley publishes a lot on this. Um, uh, but we, we, we took out reinforcement learning, plopped in this, this GA, this random search algorithm, and uh, through using Monte Carlo techniques and, and policy rollouts, we're able to train um, the same agent with a different approach um, and uh, had a, a drastically uh, um, faster training time, which I'll show in a second here. Uh, here's the pseudocode. If anybody is curious and looking at this, you can read about it in another paper from ACC um, uh, published a couple of years ago. Um, the, the result in increase in training time um, was really, really amazing uh, for, um, uh, for this application. And so when we, uh, in, in, in the different variants of random search that we tested, there's a, the, the vanilla variant, and then we introduce an atom-based uh, uh, random search um, algorithm where you replace the gradient update with the atom optimization, uh, was really like an order of magnitude speed up in the training time. Uh, for these algorithms, even though PPO and the GAs achieve the same level of reward, we're able to get there a lot faster with um, with these random search techniques. And so we think that these are more um, uh, useful to implement for the electric co-ops because you can get a result very, very quickly and more often um, uh, um, uh, as opposed to training with the traditional, you know, large compute heavy um, PPO and algorithms like that. All right, so um, I'll briefly get into what I consider one of the biggest challenges that's facing utility operators uh, moving forward and, and perhaps some research that that uh, uh, could be used to, to help the situation here. All right, so um, in my opinion, there is just an explosion in the number of buttons that an operator can press, can press nowadays. We've talked about the, the use of these grid support functions. So there's a whole host of parameters that an operator can feed to these functions. You know, we, we've talked about the grid support functions that are that are that are voltage sensitive. You have some that are frequency sensitive. You have some that are power factor sensitive. You can cascade these things. So you can say, I want to be responsive to frequency first, then voltage. They all need parameters. You have new um, devices uh, uh, that can do demand response now. You have um, uh, expanded functionality for protection and regulation systems. Uh, heterogeneous devices coming into the system. So you have thermostatically controlled loads, you have dem other demand response, you have electric vehicles and batteries. Um, and so there's just a whole lot of options an operator has uh, and things that they can do. Uh, and uh, for operators that we've talked to, it's overwhelming. And so what, I guess the research question is, how can we uh, make this decision-making problem which is a high dimensional decision-making problem, easier for operators. And uh, can we leverage tools for machine learning and AI to help with this process? So we had a, um, an internal lab directed uh, research effort. Uh, so all, all, all of the national labs of which LBNL is one, um, every dollar we bring in from DOE, we take a portion of that money, we set it aside, and then we reinvest that in fundamental research. And one of the projects that I led a few years ago was really trying to get at this problem. What, could, could, you, could you distill um, the high dimensional 
decision making for dynamic systems into a much simpler problem that you could then present to operators in a meaningful way. And so what we were trying to do was if you think about the 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 suites of the sets of parameters that that an operator could select for their power grid, some of them are going to result in a stable operation of the system. Some of them are going to result in the unstable operation of the system. Can I come up with a stability threshold? Right. And so um, without having to use you know, first principles, Lyapunov analysis or um, linearizations of the system, because you can't even write down these equations sometimes, uh, can we learn these stability thresholds? And so what we did with a, um, a, a relatively straightforward um, uh, training loop, which um, involves the, um, the, the, the selection of parameters that generate trajectories in, uh, in, in the dynamic system, which we then extract certain features from, uh, and then we will, um, based on how training, we will just new sets of parameters to test um, uh, uh, and to see if um, uh, these parameters uh, result in stable or unstable operation of the system. So it's a combination of unsupervised, supervised learning. We use autoencoders to do the feature engineering. Um, and then um, with, with the uncertainty sampling, um, uh, uh, and um, labeled parameter feature pairs. We, we train a regression model uh, to try, which which we hope will have learned what the stability thresholds are uh, in this high dimensional decision making space. And so the experiment on the right is a um, example when you have two parameters uh, that are, will dictate stability of your system, and we're trying to learn the parameters that result in a stable operation of the system. And so uh, orange and blue are the ground truth areas for um, uh, stable versus unstable. Blue is good, orange is, is not good. Uh, the dots are the prediction made by our model. What we really want are the, the red dots to be on top of the orange and the blue dots to be on top of the blue. And that is largely happening in this uh, preliminary uh, research that we've undertaken here. So we we do a fairly good job of learning um, uh, which which sets of parameters in a stable system. We're a little bit not so good when we get close to thresholds, but anybody who's whole theory knows that when you are moving your eigenvalues across the um, the real axis, um, your trajectories get kind of flat. Not a lot not not a lot of oscillations there, so it's harder to to detect those um, uh, those those transitions. Um, but uh, we do th this this result encouraging and warranting of future research. Um, uh, and uh, DOE has actually funded some work that's kind of kind of getting at this problem here. All right, if you would like to learn more, you are more than welcome to contact me at this email address. Uh, my colleague, Sean, you're talking more about uh, differential privacy and textures. He'd be happy to talk with you too. Uh, all the projects I've talked about, um, all the results that we've talked about uh, today, you can find on our website there. And um, you know, with that, I look forward to answering any any questions you guys have. Thank you, Dan, for the great presentation. I think we'll, we'll take Q and A on the chat. Uh, folks can um, place your questions there. Uh, let's see. Maybe I'll start with a couple of questions while sure. we have, uh, questions. So thank you for the presentation. In discussion with the you know, in in your signature set for inverter that you briefly talked about, it's just. Uh, you know, uh, one way that you talked about that oscillations that you had uh, modeled and uh, uh, reference to that paper. Do you see, as you talk to these uh, inverters uh, companies, you know, what other types of signatures are these signatures or synthetic signature, these signatures that we actually, that you see that you heard from these companies? Or how do we, there are several students are listening you know, or faculty who are actually working on the same area. Sure. You know, what is your perspective of, uh, you know, how do we actually model these anomalous signatures going forward and what type of specific, uh, you know, attack vectors do you see for these inverters? This is, this is, this is, this is really the, I, I think, um, a, a super important question. So what, so the, the, the reason we, we focused on these oscillations and imbalances is for a combination of reasons. First, we talked to inverter manufacturers and we, we, we asked them kind of the challenges that that they had in just setting up the parameters of what these devices should be when they go and install them in the system. And uh, anecdotally, they would tell us, boy, it's really hard to find a set of parameters because it's always oscillating, right? And, and then they'd say, oh, boy, when I set up two or three of these in a grid, we get large imbalances. And so, I mean, if they're having trouble setting these things up, right? I mean, th that, 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 that ambiguity makes it, I think, a very rich 
uh, area that an attacker can exploit. And then um, we, we also did our diligence. Like we, we did a good job modeling how the dynamics of the systems, right? So actually modeling, write down the equations of the inverter, the equations that govern the, the control laws. And then we did a ton of simulations with these, right? And, and so experimenting different parameter pairs in, in a grid and basically trying to explore kind of what, what outcomes can, can, can happen when you do a good, poor job of selecting these parameters. And so it's, it's from, from like, a, uh, we heard it right from the installers and we have the, the simulation evidence that show us that these, that these two types of attacks are concerning. However, um, this is not exhaustive. And one of the things we wanted to do back when we started this work in 2015 was actually use a, um, um, uh, a generative algorithm to try and look for different attacks that we're not even thinking about. And DOE was not really pleased with that because they didn't want to be <laughs> paying us to attack the power grid. Um, so uh, they told us explicitly not to do that. Uh, however, um, they have they have come around over the last year and are now encouraging us to do this in our later research. So in a couple of years, when our research is mature a little bit, because we just had a new project on the start in January, um, we may have new attack vectors that we're thinking about. Um, and in particular, I, I do think that when you... Um, are and so so far uh, to build on this question a little bit more we've been kind of casting a net only around the distribution system so we look at effects that are really relevant for distribution utilities when you when you cast a wider net and you look at the transmission system effects of attacks and distribution i think you're going to see a lot of new attack vectors show up there because you have different physics different dynamics that are showing up on faster time scales when you look at the transmission system Great, thank you. I think following on a question, I think we have a question called, do you have a test bed where we can create cybersecurity issues and test the controller actions? I mean, real hardware setup. Yeah, uh, so at, at LBNL, we have a very kind of simplistic one. Until a couple inverters, a couple battery systems, we have an EV there. Its configuration is, is ability is moderate. However, in the latest project I was just talking about, which was just awarded, um, we're gonna be testing this in a test bed that Siemens maintains in Princeton. Uh, uh, for their hardware. And uh, so we we do have access to, uh, and we will be testing these algorithms out in a realistic setting uh, in a year and a half. Um, and um, uh, so we do have access to that. It's not a not as widely, um, it, 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 takes a, it takes a lot to be able to access that type of test bed. So we, you know, it's a multi-million dollar project, you know, contracting with Siemens, but we do have access to that, yes. Great, and we have another question from Bo Liu. Uh, in the last slide about the safe parameter region, the input of machine learning model, is it the parameter of the ER inverter, is it correct? Yeah, so the, it, the, it's the parameters that go into the inverters that then are simulated to get their dynamics. We extract the features, we evaluate stability, and then we suggest new parameters. Great. Um, Another question. Thank you for the nice presentation. How can you get the most effective training data as all the control interferences, adaptive or reinforcement, seem to be good and dependent? Or well, so so the thing is, there is no data for this type of work, right? I mean, if these attacks were showing up in the system all over the place, I mean, there there would be data. But we're 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 getting ahead of the problem here. That's how our work is positioned. We're trying to come up. We're trying to recognize different exploits and attacks that could affect the system when large deployments of these devices show up that an adversary could take advantage of, we already want to have the solutions ready for that when that occurs. And that's why we use reinforcement learning because we generate the data on the fly, right? And so uh, that's why this these are effective tools here. You, you almost have to have this test environment that you, you, you this dynamic test environment that you're using uh, to generate this data kind of when you need it. Because there's no data sets available that, that have this 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 data, especially when you want to think about the evaluation of actions that are going to result in the mitigation of the attack. That doesn't exist. We have another question. Can you comment on how boundaries or set points were determined to reconfigure control parameters, referring to the case where reconfiguration was performed to offset perturbations on compromised units? Could you repeat that, please? Can you comment on how boundaries or set points were determined to reconfigure control parameters? I mean, is that is it how how we do it in our response, or how the utility does it when they first set up the 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 um? Do, the do, do you get that boundary set point from it? No, I mean, I so we 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 really follow the standards here. So let me go back. Aha. Uh -huh. So this table is is shows kind of what what is possible 
for these for these settings, right? These these are these are parameter ranges which are are, are fairly are fairly unrestricted. So we operate within this within this table, and um, it, it it's it, it it gets more complicated because every every device can have their individual con the parameters configured according to this table, and so due to the nonlinearities of power flow and the nonlinear dynamics at play, there actually is a very um, it's it's not intuitive when you look at this uh, when you look at this table to be able to select to identify which sets of parameters are going to result in a good operation of the system. Great. Uh, we have another question from John A. Lee. Great talk, Dan. How do you Thank envision you. A digital twin, particularly data driven approach, can help tackle the challenge? Is there any electrical system modeling and AI tools, open source data set available? So, um, I, I digital twins, I think, are the tool. Uh, for um, for enabling good cyber defense here because we you need a, you need a playground and the thing that is really holding us back right now is the the archaic nature of power system simulation tools I bet everybody on the power globe mailing list is like nodding their head right now because they all know how how limited these simulation tools are and it's the reason is it's really hard to simulate the power system like we we you you start in your courses and the first thing you learn about is DC power flow. So you make these huge approximations to the power system, right? In order to simulate this thing. And what we're finding now is when you have inverters, you can't make these, these, these um, time scale separation arguments to simplify the power grid. You have to model across all these different time ranges here. And we're at the stage where like, I have colleagues who work on this, um, where if you want to do like a, like a, like a 30 second EMT simulation of the Hawaiian grid, it takes like I don't know, 20 hours to resolve that, that simulation. Like that's ridiculous. So um, you, the, the thing that's really holding us back is the power flow simulators. Like if we can do a better job of simulating the power system, um, you're going to open up a ton of possibilities for, for these AI driven models here. And so I think there's a lot of room for innovation for using AI to build surrogate models of the power system. Like that, that's a huge area of research. I think, I hope that answers your question. Yes, I think it looks like uh, there is another question. What are the, some of the most promising techniques you have encountered for enhancing cybersecurity for the ER system? That's a great question. Uh, so I'm a big I'm a big believer in right tool for the right job. And uh, I what I see in when in in papers that I review a lot for IEEE is like a horrible misapplication of reinforcement learning. And so uh, reinforcement learning because it's so popular in in you know in the tech companies, people want to use it all the time. But it's it's oftentimes we'll use it for a problem with no dynamics. And that is not what you should be using reinforcement learning for. So, I mean, so um, this, and this, this illustrates the, the example that I showed when we, when we swapped out RL and we put in genetic algorithms, we had a, like a tenfold increase in training time, right? And so what that leads me to believe is that, that there are elements of that problem, which where the dynamics are not very prominent, not, not very important. Uh, and so, um, uh, so I would say like, it's, it's, it's really important to have knowledge of a wide variety of techniques and to really understand when you want to use these techniques and when you don't want to use them. That is super powerful. I, I would say that's more powerful than knowing all of the different reinforcement learning algorithms that are out there, knowing when you should use the family of tools and when you should put it away. We have another question from Dr. Mingxi Liu. Thank you, Dan. I'm assuming the methods are mainly developed for attacks aiming to destabilize the system. What about more stealthy attacks launched by individual DER owners who leverage the algorithm? Uh, yeah, um, learning? that's interesting. We have I haven't looked at the individual disgruntled homeowner um, uh, uh, angle yet. Um, uh, the the attacks that we we're concerned about that that our sponsor is concerned about are more I would say, um, you know, nation state level type of threats, which could bring down um, large, um, important aspects of society. So disruptions to manufacturing, um, bl causing blackouts, that sort of thing. Um, uh, I hope that answers your question. So we haven't looked at the, we haven't looked at individual bad actors yet. Um, uh, although I don't think there's anything that would, would preclude these techniques from, from being effective there once we tune the reward mechanisms accordingly. We have more questions coming in. Then. Oh boy! Another one from CB from ANL. Um, when you model oh. the inverters for your reinforcement learning environment, do you use EMT or phase domain models? Uh, we use phase domain because the 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 control functions that we're targeting right now evolve on the seconds to minute time scale. So there's no need for EMT. So, however, 
if you if, if other work we have looks at attacks at uh, phase lock loop type of controllers because there's a ton of there's a ton of issue in figuring out what frequency is in some of these when, when some of these events are occurring um, for those type of, of of applications you need you need EMT. Great, another one. Um, I think it's see. Okay, what could be the best starting point in terms of getting started in machine learning applied to power systems? Usually, we don't find any resources catering to both. At the time, how do you find relevant resources for the same? So, um, you know, th this this touches on a question I answered a little bit earlier about the nature of the data for this problem. So, for for this particular application, it was really the the creation of the proper simulation environment that enabled this research. And so, when when we looked at all the tools that were out there that we could have got our hands on for power flow studies, none of them did a good job of modeling the inverter behavior. In, in, in fact, when when Open DSS, I, you know, I love Open DSS. So if anybody works for Open for Epri, you know, like it's not directed at you on the call, but like Open DSS, when we'd give it bad parameters to create instability, Open DSS would be like, no, I won't do that. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put parameters in that I like that are gonna make the system stable because they want the user to to not be looking at like, you know. Uh, instabilities in their system. So we, we couldn't use the inverter model in OpenTSS. So we had to write our own that would actually accurately represent the behavior we wanted to see. And so like once we had that tool, that opened the door for a lot of different approaches. And it was just it was just us like, you know, reinforcement learning is great for dynamic system control. Let's try it for this particular application. We know what the attacks are. Let's see if we can tune the rewards and and and, and get these agents to actually spit out parameters that mitigate these attacks. And so it was just a lot of a lot of kind of playing around, you know, um, uh, uh, work that we did as postdocs. Um, um, uh, and it was once we had the environment, it was actually pretty easy to, to, to put this some of these algorithms together. And now we're in a position where we have the environment curated and we're trying all different kinds of algorithms. Some of the stuff we're doing now is leveraging graph theory. We're trying to train algorithms that are agnostic to different networks where you could have one agent and it's valid on every network it, it could possibly see. And so like, but it all started with that environment that we had to create. Great. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Utku Kose. Uh, um, thanks for the presentation. I would like to see if I have, if an AI-based cyber defense tool with human the loop aspects would be a good fitting to enhance DER control systems. Yes, absolutely. The, I think that is the only way this realistically works because I have not met an operator yet who has been, basically said, yeah, let's put AI in the driver's seat. I don't need to do. I don't need to touch these parameters anymore. And so, um, I, I think I think what what the what I see is the, the 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 vision and the way forward here is leveraging AI to enhance the ability of the operator to do their job. And so, if if an operator can push all these different buttons, right? Uh, can we? Uh, and and, and um, it, somebody suggests to them you should try this this deployment of parameters. You know, could it, could an operator quickly check if that is going to result in a stable or unstable operation of the system? Right. And this that goes into this slide right here. Right. If they if they have this mapping, if they have this this essentially picture and they, they can point in the parameter space and say this is good or bad, that helps them do their job. And so I think I think that that is the that is the, the loop is only closed with the operator as a part of it. We have one last question uh, from Reza Kazmi. Uh, how do you identify which systems are compromised and which are not? Uh, so um, we, we actually, we don't, we, um, so we assume that the ones are compromised are not going to respond to any commands that we give them, right? So they're, 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 they're disconnected, they're off. That's like the worst case scenario. In some of the work that we've done, particularly when we do the decentralized control, we don't make any assumptions at all. We just, we, we deploy our algorithms onto the devices. And if enough of them are there to respond, then the attack is mitigated. We don't do anything. And so um, we actually, um, so that's why DOE is attracted to this algorithm, why, they're why they want to patent it. It's like, you could include this on every device. And then it's just like a like a, a additional layer of safety that you have. If this attack shows up, the settings get changed. And then if there's enough of the devices that are behaving in, in a good fashion, the attack is, is ameliorated. Uh, great. Um, I think, you know, uh, the recording will be available. I see some questions for folks are asking, you know, it's on YouTube. If you just type um, Center for Cybersecurity UND, you should be able to find it or 
will you know look for those YouTube channel um, there. But thank you, Dan, so much for your presentation um, for today. You will receive a nice plaque from UND. For you guys are so nice. I'm gonna put that up in my office. Thank you yes. very much. And that's also a, a letter from our dean uh, from <sighs> thanking you for your contribution. That's that's great. I, I it didn't takes time and effort to do all these things. So I appreciate oh, no, no, no. your I, I, busyness I I and. I, you know. I just I love talking about this stuff, and um, you know, it's great that there is a um a, a receptive, interested community here that is um that that is is interested in these tools and techniques because, like, I, I think I think that this you know we'd be foolish to ignore all of the benefits AI can possess uh, can can allow us to achieve, and um uh, it's gonna, I think going to be a necessary tool for making the system secure in the future. So thank you for giving the opportunity to talk about this stuff. I really appreciate yeah, it. And I just want to also promote our conference coming up in October, IEEE Cybersecurity Awareness and Research Symposium. And folks can still uh, submit papers uh, for listening. And the deadline is July 15th for final papers. So if you are considering uh, any have papers on DERs or cybersecurity, please uh, consider your submission. Yeah, thank you, Dan. We'll be in touch with you. I think I look forward to have more conversations. I would, I would love that very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.